series, in March. Tonight we have an excellent guest. You'll find out who it is in a minute if you don't know who it is already. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dan, W2DLT, the vice president of the club. Uh, question. How many different people that aren't members of the Fairlawn Radio Club do we have? We're not going to go name by name, but okay. Show of hands. Show of hands is good. What clubs do you represent? Fair. 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 I'm sorry? Roseland. Roseland. Great. Welcome. Farrah. NJDXA. NJDXA. What else? I'm sorry? Park Square. Wow. Great, great. Providence. New Providence, okay. Barry Cohen's old <laughs> Persephone. Persephone, all right. We've got most of the state covered here. Yeah. Welcome. If you'd like to join the Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club. We have applications available. We do all kinds of programs like this every month. And we are now open Thursdays and Fridays at the clubhouse, which is not far from here. Uh, with that, I will turn. Whoops. Where is Great Falls located? Where? In Patterson, New Jersey. Patterson, New Jersey, thank you. If you haven't been there, it's worth seeing, but it's even better to see it on the day that we operate from there. Uh, I will turn it over to Ed, WX2R, or PIO, and uh, he has some announcements also. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, everybody. And well, so we're really glad you're here for a really special night. So, without further ado, let me turn the program over tonight to tonight's speaker. And we are really honored on behalf of this school to have Joe Tim. Uh, K1JT was first licensed as KN2 ITP in 1954 and has since helped call signs K2 ITP, WA1 LXQ, W1 HFV, VK2 BJX, and of course, K1JT. <coughs> He was professor of astronomy at the University of Massachusetts from 1969 to 1981, and since then professor of physics at Princeton University, serving there also as the dean of faculty for six years and retiring in 2006. Well, he never really retired. <laughs> he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Phys Physics in 1993 for the discovery of the first orbiting pulsar, leading to observations that established the existence of gravitational waves. After retirement, he's been busy developing and enhancing digital protocols for weak signal communication by amateur radio, including JT65, Whisper, and of course, FT8, who chases DX from 160 meters through the microwave bands. On behalf of the club, it really is a great honor to bring to you Joe Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Thanks, everybody. It's really great to be here with you. I'm uh, looking forward to this evening, and I hope you are, too. Um, so, so I don't waste too much time uh, telling you stuff you already know. Let me get a show of hands. Uh, uh, first, those who know what FT8 is. That's almost everybody, I guess. Those who have actually used it on the air? Quite a few, yep. Um, are there folks in the room who have not used it but intend to use it at some time. Yeah, a few. And are there some in the room who have not used it, would never use it because it's ruining amateur radio? <laughs> Maybe not too many. So uh, anyway, I, my plan is to uh, give you a, a mixture of, of uh, a, a bit of the internal details on how FT8 works, um, a little bit about the history of, of developing it and, and uh, how it took off so quickly, just a couple of years ago, and then uh, look a little bit into the future. Uh, that's why the and beyond stuff here. Uh, in fact, you'll learn some things tonight that uh, basically have been under wraps up until now, so we're unwrapping them this evening, if you like. So um, FT8 was first introduced publicly in, in July of 2017, just a little, you know, not quite two years ago. Um, we were thinking primarily of uh, a mode for VHF, for six meters in particular, uh, where we wanted to be able to be sure we could catch the short openings, particularly the transcontinental openings or even transatlantic, transoceanic openings that typically don't last very long, have a lot of QSB up and down. Uh, JT65 was used for a lot of those uh, contacts in several years before this, but it was always frustrating because the guy would fade out just before you got his Rogers 
or something to complete the contact. So we wanted something that would be faster and yet still quite sensitive uh, for very weak signals. So that was the basic idea. We were not especially thinking about HF operation, although we were well aware at that point that JT65, which after all had been built for uh, moon bounce operation with really weak signals, uh, had become very popular on the HF bands because basically I think because it enabled people that were limited to either low power or small antennas or both uh, to work DX around the world uh, that you couldn't do on, on single sideband or even CW. Um, so uh, FT8, like the other weak signal modes in WSJTX, uh, uses very short structured messages. And I'll go through that a little bit, but since so many of you have used it, you're already familiar with that, so we can go, go through it pretty quickly. FT8 uses sequences only 15 seconds long instead of one minute, so it's four times faster than JT65. For that, you give up a bit of sensitivity, but, um, and, and you need a little bit more bandwidth uh, th than you would with the same number of tones, so we cut back the number of tones from 65 and JT65 to only eight, so to keep the bandwidth reasonable. Uh, it works nevertheless down to sensitivities, uh, signal to noise ratios of the order of minus 21 dB uh, measured in the typical uh, single sideband uh, filter passband of 2500 hertz. Um, it turns out to be very effective for the originally designed purpose of uh, double hop e-skip on, on six meters, but it also works very well for the other purposes for which uh, these modes have become very popular, um, HF DXing and uh, so forth. It's obviously not a mode for rag chewing. These are very short, very simple messages. You exchange call signs, signal reports, Roger, maybe a little bit of chit chat if, if nothing busy is calling you away, but uh, the chit chat amounts to just saying, thanks, 73, good luck, something like that. Very little more happens in these QSOs. Uh, you may have seen this uh, slide before or something similar to it. It was updated recently. It shows the uh, relative uh, frequency of use uh, of different modes uh, according to this uh, English out outfit that keeps a, a big uh, uh, log called Club Log. It's sort of like Logbook of the World, but the purpose is somewhat different. It doesn't, uh, uh, it's not involved in, in uh, awards or anything like that. He just is interested in the statistics. So here's July of 2017. Here's 2018, the beginning of this year. So this is a two year span. And you can see that it just took off like uh, nobody's business. You couldn't, we couldn't believe it. Uh, it was not what we had in mind. Uh, we were thinking of six meter DX, uh, and it's good for that, but it's good for a lot of other stuff too. Some other interesting things here. This is, uh, okay, uh, phone. This is basically single sideband. This is CW. Uh, PSK 31 and RIDI and things like that are down here. This purple line was uh, basically JT65 and JT9, the other uh, modes in, in WSJT and WSJTX. And those modes basically faded away on HF usage at the same time that FT8 took over. So you can sort of see what's been happening. This is now showing that something like 70% of the QSOs that are uploaded to, log, to uh, Club Log are using FT8. And everything else is about 30%. It's remarkable. Of course, it, it, uh, if, if you measured things in a different way, like how long was the QSO and things like that. Well, you know, people using sideband have a good chat often. That's not the same thing. But anyway, as far as just logging different contacts in, and putting them in the log, uh, people are finding FT8 is a lot of fun and spending a lot of time with it. This is good statistics too. There are almost 80 million QSOs in this club log database over a couple of years. So a lot of people upload their logs there frequently and uh, so it's, it's good worldwide statistics on the usage of these various different modes. So some, uh, let's see uh, one more show of hands. Uh, those who know what PSK Reporter is, uh, not quite as many, but lots of people do, obviously. It's one of the reasons I think that FT8 has become so popular uh, because since the, uh, the way the system operates, uh, when you copy a call sign, uh, when, when somebody is calling CQ, you also get his four digit grid locator. So you know where he is, he or she is, along with what the call sign is, and therefore you can easily have the program upload that information to PSK Reporter, a, a website, a, a central database. And PSK Reporter, of course, 
plots these things on a world map, and I'll show you some of those in a few minutes. So you can immediately see when you call CQ, wait a couple of minutes and look at PSK Reporter, you can see where you're being copied all over the world. It's fascinating. It's almost as good as Whisper, which is good for the same sort of thing, but here you can also have responses to your calls and have a two-way conversation, uh, two-way exchange of, of uh, signal reports and so forth. Um, so there are a lot of uh, spots being uploaded now uh, using FT8 to PSK Reporter. The, the numbers uh, per hour vary through the week and over the 24-hour day, but they max out at close to a million, to close to a million spots per hour. And uh, typically, they're somewhere around half a million spots per hour. That's a lot of statistics. So you get a lot of information by looking at PSK Reporter website. Uh, typically, there are a few thousand uh, different monitoring stations in any particular hour. There are a few thousand different transmitting stations shown with their signals being decoded on PSK Reporter during any hour. And if you look over a 24-hour period, uh, at the spots copied by a particular station, typically the, uh, he, he gives you some statistics on the, on the back page of the PSK Reporter site. Uh, the, the top spotter typically has somewhere around 150 DXCCs uh, copied and uh, uploaded to, to a PSK Reporter in a 24-hour period, and something closer to 200 over, uh, over a week. This is, and remember, we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. Nothing much is happening. Uh, these are mostly, uh, you know, most of the DX is daytime on 20 meters or nighttime on 40 meters. The bands, uh, the higher bands aren't much good these days, as you're well aware. So a little bit about the protocol. Um, it's a carefully designed, uh, uh, optimized protocol for good signal to noise ratio, very low error rate, uh, copyability with uh, reasonable software, all those kinds of things go into the thinking about it. Uh, so it uses simple user messages. They are compressed down to always exactly 77 bits. So there are 77 bits of information. If you think of this in terms of the way we ordinarily exchange information, say an email or that sort of uh, uh, system, uh, a character is usually one byte, eight bits. Maybe you can pare it down if you don't have to have both capital and, and lowercase letters. You can pare it down to something more like six bits. But uh, if you look at that, to fit uh, character by character information into a 77-bit message means you're talking about only about a dozen characters. And in fact, uh, that's correct. If, if we send free text messages that you, where you can send anything with with all the 26 letters of the alphabet and uh, 10 digits and a small number of punctuation marks as sort of the alphabet of available characters, that's actually a little bit less than six bits per character. It's about 5.4 bits. So you can fit 13 bits of, uh, 13 characters of information. But if you've got uh, special formatted information, such as uh, somebody else's call sign, your own call sign, and then a grid locator or a signal report, that can be compressed into a, uh, a smaller number of bits because we know something about the way call signs and grid locators and signal reports are formatted. So that, you, know, you can squeeze the information down more. Anyway, that's part of the design that goes into this to make the maximum amount of information for basic minimal QSOs uh, be exchanged with the minimum number of possible bits. Then to that number of bits in FT8, we add 14 bits in a so-called cyclic redundancy check, a CRC. And that is there so that when the uh, receiving software uh, decodes the information and tries to reproduce the original message, it also uh, reproduces what the CRC was transmitted as, but it can compute the CRC from the 77-bit message. And if that doesn't match with the CRC that was returned, it knows there's something wrong with this frame, this copy, and it ditches the whole thing. So you don't see garbage coming out of the uh, decoder. You either see exactly what was transmitted or you see nothing at all. Uh, false decodes or, or screwy uh, garbage decodes are, in fact, very rare. It's not never quite, but it's close to that. Then, uh, that, so that makes 91 bits. 77 and 14 is 91. Then we go through an error correction code, so-called forward error correction, which means that instead of transmitting over the air in 91 bits, 
we send actually almost twice that many. So there's a lot of redundancy built into the message packet. And that redundancy is such that uh, it makes it possible to decode the 91-bit message, 77 information bits and a 14-bit check, checksum, basically. Uh, it makes it possible to, to uh, decode that uh, in such a way that it appears to be 100% copy mo most all the time. Uh, and if the CRC doesn't match, you just get nothing. Um, even if some of the bits are corrupted during transmission, you get a little QRM or a fade out or something, so that maybe only of these 174, maybe only about 150 turned out to be correct. But that 24-bit error is not so large that you can't recover the original message. Um, uh, you know, this kind of thing is done all, all over the place now in, in your, your home and mine and everywhere else. Error correction codes are built into things like CD-ROMs, the uh, music CDs have it, uh, DVDs have it, uh, even uh, uh, digital TV these days has it so that, you know, you, you don't get fuzz or, or snow or whatever. Yeah, question? Yeah, on the, uh, on the actual code. Yeah. The, uh, could the code withstand, let's say, if, if, does the error have to be statistically uniform across the pack? The, the, error, the error can basically be anywhere, and, and uh, there's an upper limit to the number of incorrect bits that you can have received. It's not even quite as, as, uh, as, as black and white as that, because individual bits, uh, you can not only decide whether one of these 174 bits was a zero or a one, but you can decide with what confidence you have uh, to make that decision. So there's le different levels of, of, uh, of how, how confident you are about each one of the bits of information. And those things are basically built into the mathematical algorithms that go behind the code. The code itself is called a low density parity check code. It's an interesting coding scheme that was in fact invented back in the 1960s. It, I'll get to your question in just a second. Uh, in the 1960s, there's a, 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 thesis, a PhD thesis by a student at MIT uh, called Gallagher. Gallagher. Uh, these are often referred to nowadays as Gallagher codes, but they were never used for the next uh, 35 years or so because it requires a fair bit of computing capability to decode these codes. Uh, these days, we all have that in our cell phone, practically, uh, let alone our desktop computer. So we can do it easily now, but until the 1990s or so, these things were known about, but were basically not feasible to be used in a normal situation. A question now. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, like, uh, if I'm a little too slow to uh, respond to an interesting CQ, yeah. and uh, my, radio, my system will start transmitting, but it seems like I lost, like, say, the first five seconds of uh, the full 12, uh, 24 seconds. Yeah. Now, am I just putting a QR into the uh, you, you're, or your, your transmission is something even if your transmission starts late by three or four seconds, you may still be decoded. Those early bits will be lost, but it, if, if otherwise your signal is pretty good, you, you may still get enough, uh, a large enough fraction of that 174 bits to be able to decode the message. So I wouldn't worry about it, just let it go. You're, ne you're not causing any more QRM than- Let's be transmit. <laughs> yeah. It's not a complete- uh... Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's carry on. Uh, the, the synchronization is an important issue in all of these modes. Uh, the uh, exact frequency at which the transmitter is, is uh, at which the, say the lowest of the eight tones is centered, uh, is not known to the receiver. So it has to try to figure that out. Uh, even if you both set your dials at the same frequency and even set your audio tone markers at the same frequency, your rig and his rig is probably not calibrated to within a few hertz, and we need to get the frequency accurate to a fraction of a hertz. Well, that's part of the job of the DSP processing then, is to find that. And to make that possible, and to make the time alignment of the received signal uh, correct relative to the beginning of where the message is, that requires time synchronization. So we need to synchronize in both time and frequency. And we do that with a special sequence of, of uh, symbols that is put into the message in addition to these 174 uh, information bits uh, so that the transmitter and receiver can be synchronized properly. The modulation used in FT8 is uh, eight tone frequency shift keying. Um, 
and it's done at uh, a, a keying rate of six and a quarter baud uh, with the tones separated by six and a quarter hertz. So the total amount of spectrum used is basically eight times six and a quarter hertz, that's 50 hertz. So that's why these little stripes on your waterfall are 50 hertz wide. That, that's the width of the signal. Uh, and the length of the transmission is just a little less than the 15 seconds. We cut it off at 12.64 seconds. That's the total amount of time required to send all of this and all of this uh, at, at this rate. And uh, we wanted that to come out as something a little bit less than the 15 second timed sequencing so that there's time for the decoder to work before you have to start your next transmission on the, on the uh, 15 second mark. So that's a basic rundown of how FT8 works. Now, uh, since most people in here have already made FT8 QSOs, we don't need to spend much time on this. You know that basically somebody calls CQ, somebody answers him, you send him a signal report, he comes back with a Roger and your signal report. You say Roger or maybe Roger and 73 all in one line, but basically that's the contact. So uh, something like between four and six transmissions, two or three by each station makes a QSO. If you're in a contest, you can cut it a little bit quicker, but this is basically the, uh, the mode. And if you wanted to send something like, uh, if somebody you know, you can say, thanks, Jim, 73, you can say that down here in the last thing. And in those messages where you basically could just can say anything, you can say anything, but it has to fit into 13 characters, including, including the spaces. So you can't say much. You can say a little bit. Uh, so these are the structured messages of, of uh, FT8 and most of the other digital modes that are in that software package, WSJTX. Question, there seems to be some controversy or difference as to what constitutes an actual official QSO. Oh, well, I mean, don't pay too much attention to, people like to argue about these things. Uh, I, th I mean, it's up to you. If, if you think you've exchanged uh, call signs and a signal report and got an acknowledgement, put it in your log. That's, that's good enough for me. So when I, when, I re when I receive a Roger, it's in my log. Okay, you don't need a 73, but that's a polite way to end a contact. What, what's the difference uh, between the, uh, you could comment the amount of tones used in a transmission, let's say JT65 versus FT8. What is the relationship of the amount of tones used and the sensitivity of the signal, the robustness, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question, Dave. Uh, it basically boils down to issues of bandwidth. The, because, you know, noise is broadband, so the narrower you can make your detection bandwidth, the less noise you have. But you can't make the detection bandwidth smaller than the intrinsic bandwidth of the signal, or you're starting to cut out signal. Now, in all of these modes, we're talking about frequency shift keying, where you send a different tone for a specified amount of time, and then the next tone for, which may be diff a different frequency, for, for the same specified amount of time. Those, those times basically sell, tell you how broad each one of those tones is in frequency. And in FT8, the tones are about six and a quarter hertz wide, each one. So the receiving filters, software filters now I'm talking about, are matched the band, to the bandwidth of the signal itself. So the receiving filters have six and a quarter hertz bandwidth. They are matched filters to the a modulation scheme that's being used. JT65 has the tones separated by about 2.7 hertz. So it's uh, what? It's a little more than a third of this, of six and a quarter. So JT65 is more sensitive because there is less noise on top of each tone that's been detected by the receiver. There are other subtle differences because. Yeah. The, uh, uh, JT65 also has error checking. It's a different type of error checking. It's so-called Reed Solomon codes, which are the same as the ones that are used in audio CDs instead of a low density parity check code. But uh, although the mathematics is different, the basic purpose is the same. Okay, so let's carry on. Uh, a little bit more about these structured messages just because you may be interested. Uh, so why do we have uh, the maximum limit set at 77 bits? It originally, by the way, in JT65, it was 72 bits. We've made it a little bit bigger be for reasons that'll become clear to you in a couple of minutes. But basically, it turns out that any standard call sign uh, worldwide, ham call sign, can be coded into 28 bits. 
So if we're going to send a message that has two call signs and then something else, typically this is either a four-digit locator or a signal report or a Roger or a 73, something like that. It turns out these each require 28 bits. This one requires 15 bits. Add those up, you get 71. But we're talking about 77. So what's this extra six bits in these two cases? Those six bits, and that's one of the reasons why FT8 is a little bit more capable than the earlier modes were, those six bits allow us to make distinctions between different types of messages. And I'll get to the different types in just a minute. Um, the, the original uh, packet was 72 bits. 28 and 28 and 15 makes 71. And we had one extra bit, which was just a flag to indicate is this a normal call sign type, uh, call sign and signal report uh, message, or is this a free text message like this one down here? If that bit was set, then it was 71 bits for the 13 characters plus one more bit to say, I'm a free text message instead of I'm a, I'm a call sign message. Well, now we've, we've expanded that one bit to six bits. So let's explore those six bits just a little bit. So. There's just, I just basically listed some of the different message types that are now supported in FT8. You can have the standard call, two call signs and a report or a locator. You can have free text. Those are the two that were originally there anyway. Now you can also have non-standard call signs, say special event call signs or a call sign with a, 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 a DXCC uh, prefix first and then a slash and then a call sign if you're operating portable in the Caribbean or something like that. Um, and then there are special formats for various popular contests, all of which were in the first place of some interest to those of us who were doing the coding, and in the second place where we've had a lot of user interest expressed, asking for, can't you do something a little bit better for VHF contests, whatever. So we put in features that support North American VHF contests, the European VHF contests, the ARRL ready contest, and field day, and a special different mode for de-expedition usage that I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, has anybody worked stations using the fox and hound mode? Yeah, a few of you have. It's a lot of fun, uh, and it works well also. So why do these contests need different kinds of formats? Well, in the uh, North American VHF contests, uh, I think all of them now, uh, ARRL, CQ, et cetera, they all exchange four-digit locators as, as the uh, as the contest exchange. So that has to be supported. Uh, that was supported anyway in the basic messages, but we made it a little bit easier to do that by uh, circumventing the need to also exchange uh, signal reports. You can just make the contact by sending your locator, getting the other guy's locator, and exchanging a Roger. Um, the European VH VHF contests are quite different. They are distance scored, and you have to exchange six-digit locators so instead of 15 bits, that turns out to be about 25 bits. That's a lot more bits. So we had to exchange some other things. And it, you, uh, you don't necessarily, after you've made the contact, uh, the, 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 you've, you've established contact with somebody, you then, then don't have to send both his call and your, call, call, your own call in every successive transmission. So we can squeeze the, the six-digit locator in there instead, things like that. They also, they require both a six-digit locator and a serial number for the contact, starting at one and so counting up from there. So that's a rather more, con more uh, uh, ex extensive uh, contest exchange. The ARRL Ready Round Top is a good contest. Uh, and uh, for the first time this year, FT8 was, was uh, explicitly permitted in it. That contest, although it's always been called the Ready Contest, uh, has always been a multi-mode contest, basically any any digital mode was legal in it. But uh, in fact, none of the other digital modes was very uh, popular in that contest because they don't, they're not very good contesting modes. So we tried to make FT8 at least workable for uh, the, the RIDI contest, and it turned out to be pretty popular this year. I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. Field day is a great uh, opportunity for using um, um, FT8, and I expect it will be popular uh, th this year in field day. Uh, so the ready roundup, you exchange uh, a signal report and your state or Canadian province, if you're in North America, or if you're DX, you exchange a signal, a signal report and a serial number. Um, in field day, of course, you give your uh, 
your operating class like six alpha or whatever it is, and and uh, and then your ARRL section. Uh, the fox and hound mode is a lot of fun, and we'll get to that in a minute. But that basically is where you've got a situation where uh, many people are the hounds are all trying to work one DX station, one desired DX station, so the so-called fox, and uh, that is a somewhat different uh, since it's not a symmetric situation where everybody is trying to work somebody else, but anybody else. Uh, here, everybody is trying to get one person. It's a pileup, and uh, that requires somewhat different uh, operating capabilities. Uh, the telemetry, uh, I don't think it's been widely used yet, but we made it possible for uh, um, FTA to be used for sending any arbitrary 71-bit string of bits. Um, and so you could, uh, people, have, for example, have had uh, Whisper or JT9 transmitter is on a balloon that is sent up and maybe flies around the world. A few of them have done that. And uh, FT8 would be good for that now too because you can send telemetry data back uh, by that mode. Okay, so let's carry on. Um, here's uh, PSK Reporter for the, uh, uh, and uh, I just wanted to emphasize there's a really good marriage between uh, WSJT and, and uh, PSK Reporter. Remember now we've, we've got here a world map um, daytime here, nighttime on the left and right. Uh, different colors indicate different bands, and we'll just go quickly through these. Uh, so here's an all-band full-screen picture of PSK Reporter at some time. I think this was done uh, from, the, from the fact of, of what the daylight zone looks like. This must have been done around the equinox, but I forget if it was uh, l last fall or maybe last spring. I, I don't remember which it was, but it's, it's quite a while ago. It's not just yesterday. Uh, but you can see that, uh, say, the blue ones over here, that's 40 meters. The yellow here is 20 meters. 20 meters is a daytime band, 40 meters is good at night, and so forth. So here's 160 meters. The Europeans were all working themselves in the evening. The sunlight is, is beginning to cross the Atlantic here. Nobody's on in the US yet, practically. Uh, a few of the Europeans are working into Australia or New Zealand, probably on the, uh, on the gray line to New Zealand. Looks like fun. Here's 80 meters, almost the same thing. Here's 40 meters. Beginning to, uh, you know, you can work a few across the Atlantic in the early, uh, this is just early afternoon still. Uh, they must be pretty good stations. Signals aren't strong yet. But they'll be picking up later in the evening. Here's 30 meters. Lots of transatlantic stuff going on. Here's 20 meters. Again, very good stuff in the daytime. 17 meters, and I think now you'll see that this was uh, at least a year ago because even 15 meters is open, and <laughs> not much recently, and even 12 meters and 10 meters. Look at the 10 meter things. I think that was a year ago. Boy, I haven't seen anything like that for a while. So anyway, it, uh, you can always uh, put up PSK Reporter and see what bands are open to what part of the world. There are enough FT8 operations on now that if you just use FT8 to look at it, you can immediately find out uh, what's open. Now, remember, FT8 was really, uh, we were thinking about six meters when we did this, when we uh, started writing the code. And so we wanna see what six meters is like. And this was uh, early, this was early, uh, I think it was, this was May a year ago. So the Europeans are all working each other on, on, uh, on FT8 and six meters in, uh, in the early part of the, of the sporadic E season last year. But last summer, 2018 summer in the Northern Hemisphere was a really great year for six meter DXing. And I just want to show you a few examples. Here's six meters across the Atlantic on the 16th of June in the evening. Uh, all of us were just having a ball working Europeans uh, and uh, they were strong, some of them. Uh, it was easy to raise uh, many, many hundreds, thousands probably of QSOs made on six meters. Here's a couple days later in the, in the morning Again, the band is open already. The Europeans, are, oops, the Europeans are, oh, slipping the wrong way here. The Europeans are working down into Africa as well, but we're basically working into the Caribbean. The Europeans are working everything from the Caribbean up to at least Illinois or maybe down into Texas. Uh, the band was great. Here it is again. Oh, uh, most of these have been done with, the, with PSK reporters set in one particular uh, set of options, but you can set different options and just for fun, You'd like to know sometimes who's hearing me. And so put your own call sign in here where I've indicated 
instead of putting anybody in there, uh, leaving it blank, put your own call sign in. And then you can see everybody that's copied you in the past 20 minutes or so. And it even tells you how long ago it was that they copied you. So here I am, uh, basically, I don't know, I'm calling CQ or something, and you can see who's copying me. Uh, here it is a little bit later. I've got my antenna probably pointed to Europe because I'm, I'm lighting up most of Italy and France and, and into England. But uh, off the back of my beam, they're even copying me in California. It's, the, the band was just in great shape. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and here's one example on the 20th of June last summer where I think this is uh, one uh, 15 second interval where whatever this is, 30 or, or more stations are decoded in one 15 second interval. Here you can see them all lined up. Uh, here you can see the ones that I'm actually working. Uh, these were all worked in, in five minutes or something here. And these other ones were all copied, but not, you know, I haven't worked them yet, or, or maybe I worked them already. Anyway, you can see that when things get busy uh, on six meters, it, it's uh, uh, even across the Atlantic, FT8 works really well. Um, there's another example of, I was just being copied more or less anywhere in, in the US and down into the Caribbean, probably into the northern part of, they were there in, is in Guatemala. Lots of fun. Um, one couple of days, we even worked into Japan. You can see China there. Um, I haven't quite uh, finished my DXCC on six meters, but I'm at 92. <laughs> so it's getting close. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so let's say a few words about D expedition mode because it's fun. So we've got one fox and many hounds that are all trying to uh, catch the fox. Uh, it works uh, in this mode very well with, with uh, even with algae propagation, which uh, was good. The, the first real thorough test we had of, of FT8 with using this de-expedition mode was when a, a group went to Baker Island last summer. Uh, they were using the call sign KH1 slash KH7Z. There's a good story about that, by the way. Baker Island is KH1. So why didn't they get a call sign KH1Z? Because there's no post office on Baker Island. There's, there's nothing on Baker Island. It's just that it's just a dead island. And the FCC won't give you a, a call sign if there's not a post office address in the, wherever you are. So they gave them KH7Z. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so it, it was really thoroughly tested by these guys. And, and they, uh, they worked with us on developing the, uh, the protocol, the exchange, and exactly how it was going to work. And they used it very effectively. And it, they, they made. QSOs at, at about, well, as fast as you can do it on RIDI or, and probably faster than you can do it on CW uh, at the maximum rates. Uh, probably not quite as fast as you can do it on sideband. A, a good pile-op operator can probably do even better than that. They averaged probably not this high, but they averaged maybe in the 200s when they were, had good conditions. It's been used since by a lot of different uh, D expeditions. We recommended, by the way, that it not be used except by uh, real significant de-expeditions to rare places. Uh, one of the reasons is that, as you'll see in a minute, maybe you know, maybe you don't already, that uh, the protocol allows the DX station to be working up to five stations at once. It just basically, instead of sending one FTA signal, it sends several of them side by side, separated by 60 hertz. And uh, so the transmitter power has to be divided among all those. That means you lose a little bit of sensitivity by using multiple signals, but uh, if conditions are good enough, and if you're running some power anyway, you can easily work the people that, uh, uh, in, in all, all of those different slots. Um, so this is what the waterfall looks like when you're running fox and hound mode. Uh, here you can see, a this is a 15 second interval, this is the next interval and so forth. So the, the horizontal green lines separate the transmitting and receiving intervals. So I'm just uh, basically, uh, quiet here transmitting, I'm just listening. And here's the fox with all five signals. Here he is with only three signals. Here he is with five signals again. And here are all the hounds trying to call him. And we have, uh, the, the, uh, the instruction manual gives you a lot of details on what you're supposed to do. To call the fox, you have to call 
above 100, uh, sorry, above 1,000 hertz. Um, the Fox always stays down here in the, in the low end. Uh, everybody else should be above 1,000 or after they have been acknowledged and are sending a signal report to the Fox, then they move down into here so that uh, they're not, they don't have QRM with all the other hounds. Uh, it, it seems like a good way to do it and it works pretty well. And of course, this is all done automatically if your radio is under computer control. So you pick a frequency up here to call on. If he acknowledges you, automatically your next transmission will be put down in here where you probably won't get any, any QRM. Yeah. Your, your computer sets your new transmit frequency down there. Yeah. It has nothing to him, nothing to do with him controlling your... No, he doesn't control you. It's done by you. Okay. The, the only thing he controls is he, he sends you a report and your receiver recognizes you. I've got a report, then it puts me down there. But it's your, it's your computer that moves you down there. Yeah.